Hello, folks. It's wonderful to be here. I uh, just want to share with you um, who I am in terms of the journey that I want to take you on, in terms of seven steps toward peace. And it's a life journey. And all life journeys really begin with yourself. And in terms of myself, I'm here in Berkeley. I was just in my room practicing, uh, and I was taking a shower, and I was doing well, and I got out of the shower, and I hadn't a clue as to what had just happened, and I had to take a shower all over again. <laughs> because I didn't know what had happened. And that's why I became a professor, because this is what professors do. Um, but, uh, and I'm sure you know this from class. Uh, but what, I, uh, what my origins are, I'm a Bostonian, and the odd thing that's happened in the last two days is that my origins are exactly the same, separated by some years, from uh, Leonard Nimoy of blessed memory, uh, Mr. Spock. As a matter of fact, my early, early job when I was uh, growing up was as a rabbi of the synagogue that he had been in. He was Orthodox, I was Orthodox, he was from a ghetto, I was from a, a spiritual ghetto, he was from Ukraine originally, I was from Ukraine, and at the same time, we had lost everything in Eastern Europe to the Holocaust, and at the same time, a deeply intellectual environment. So, in some ways, this is dedicated to Leonard Nimoy of blessed memory, uh, live long and prosper, Mr. Spock. <laughs> um, that sheltered environment uh, led me on a journey because the essential journey and the question that I had in that journey was this. How is it possible that in, in the extraordinary history of humanity, the very same people in one circumstance can be angels and in other circumstances they can be mo monsters? How does that happen? What are the mechanics of that on a psychological level? What is the philosophy that it can explain that? And what is the ethics that can bring people from one space of monstrosity to a space of redemption and, uh, and goodness? And this was the image that was always in my mind. Because all of the life that we had had in, in Ukraine a hundred years before was all buried now like this poor man underneath the catastrophe of the Holocaust, and the demagoguery and the obedience that leads to mass murder to this day in pockets of the world. And at the same time, I was trying to understand how could it be that this same civilization, in this case German civilization, gave birth to the most important man in my young life who had influenced my rabbis, Immanuel Kant, an amazing German pietist who gave us the answers to really the civilization that we build today, including the United Nations and the rule of law and perspective taking of the categorical imperative. How could that be both? And I would eventually do peace work for the last 30 years. I wrote a bunch of books. The people liked the books. Oxford liked the books. I ended up as a professor somehow, but mostly, I know, it's a little bit strange, because mostly I was an activist, I was a peace activist. And we started working, and I was learning from thousands of students from around the world in their situations of conflict, of violence, of what were the answers possibly to where and how we become good despite the worst of circumstances. Um, all these people influenced me. And I urge you to read as widely as possible. Because from the ancients to the moderns, from the philosophers to the psychologists, all the way to the neuroplasticity theoreticians who've spoken at TED, all the way to Granovetter right here in California, on the social networks and the power of social networks to move things in one direction or another, we started to see, and I started to see, some possible solutions to everything that we were looking at. But the key to all of it was Marty Seligman's work, who was kind of a transitional figure between a focus on the horror and the negative of the 20th century and the depression that results from that and the capacity of the brain to focus on the positive, to focus on empathy, and to become a powerful agent of human change in a very liberating way. The fact is that we are beings who slowly change for the better in these ways. We have empathy, we have reason, we have the capacity to build business between each other, and, and women's empowerment is revolutionizing the planet as nonviolent agents of change, and then the rule of law comes, and that rule of law makes us obedient to the law rather than a fascist, rather than a demagogue, and it all depends on having that positive vision. Now, despite all of this good news, I was very frustrated with the world of peacebuilding because we were so poor, we were burnt out, 
Most of the world doesn't understand what we do. And so I built a company with my partners, my amazing partners, an equal company between Arabs and Jews that was focused on multiple narratives in the Holy Land and um, a focus on fair wages and equality, absolute equality, from the bottom up, from the bus driver, from the taxi driver to the business. And what happened was amazing. Because at all of that time, I had been unable to raise a dime for poor people, for people who were suffering. And before we knew it, we were putting a million dollars a year into the local economy from the bottom up. Because commerce has that power to join people's basic human needs and to do it on an equal basis revolutionizes history. So we did this work in Israel-Palestine, but also I was starting to do work for 12 years in the state of Syria, in the middle of the dictatorship. I like challenges. I like impossible places. This suit was bought for me by Alawite and Sunni students together who loved me in Syria, my, my students in Syria, before the war. And I wear it to remember them, to remember that they're on opposite sides now and they're dying and they're suffering by the millions. And we did this great work, but there were catastrophes that started to develop more and more even in that dictatorship. One of them was the catastrophe of the American war in Iraq. Because after 9-11, a million refugees were there in, in Syria, in Aleppo, in a town that's now destroyed. And I was in a big mosque, the biggest mosque, and I was there with the Mufti. And the Mufti introduced me, and we barely spoke. We were always under police. That's where I learned how to be positive. If you say something positive all the time, you're OK in a dictatorship. If you say anything negative, you're out. So I learned how to be very, very positive, not based on Seligman's research, based on saving people's lives. And so one thing that happened was that he's sitting there, the mufti, and he, and he says to me, this man over here lived in a coffin for 21 days in Abu Ghraib. And I looked at this man's eyes, and he was, it was that faraway look of a pain person. And I, and I went over to him, and I stopped the proceedings in the mosque. And I went over to him, and I asked him his name, and I said, who are you? And where do you come from? And he told me about his brother who's still missing from Abu Ghraib. And I promised him that I would speak to people and tell them about your brother. And then I held his arm and I said, I want to apologize to you in the name of the American people. And what happened as a result, I thought we were having a private conversation. It was headlines across Syria the next day in three newspapers. And it had ripple effects up and down the spectrum because of that moment of empathy. And this is the power of what any one of us can do at any moment in time with a perfect stranger. The stranger is the key to the change of history. The stranger is the key to healing the planet. Another story. This time, much more recently in 2011, the war has broken out. It's a catastrophe. The Arab Spring is a catastrophe, the demonstrations, because on the one side, the dictatorship decides to kill 200,000 people torture and rape thousands, and at the same time, other parties decide to put in the most extremist people from all over the world to fight and destroy the Syrian people from all sides. And we're in a refugee camp in Turkey with my students, and we're allowed in. We begged our way, we pushed our way in, and we're in this, and it was exactly like this kind of scene, and everybody is upset. Nobody speaks the language. The Turkish soldiers have guns. Nobody knows what's going on. We're not allowed to bring anything in. And my students and I walk quickly through the camp. We're being pushed to walk and walk fast with my, Syrian, my amazing Syrian partners, the Kabawats. And as we get to the exit, I get my people out. But I'm surrounded all sides by these kids. And the kids are pressing on me. And they don't want me to leave. And I find my feet not moving. And this barbed wire over here and a gate, and my students are calling to me and holding their hands out to come. And suddenly, I'm in a concentration camp, and I don't want to go. And that was the moment that was the circle of the victimization in my own internal private world and fearful world that I grew up in. And now I'm in the land of my supposed enemies, and I want to be with them in the camp. And this is what a journey towards the stranger can do for all of us. This is how we change history, with intelligence, with empathy, with reason. 
with networks, and then the people come. And people love each other across enemy lines in ways that people who are in policy-making circles do not understand at all. But we do. And we can change the world with these people. We did manage to reach across the lines in Israel-Palestine. We did manage to reach across the lines in Syria with these amazing people. We did reach across the lines, even in the middle of the war, to these, to these poor orphans. We did, and I'm, be, I'm going to be with these kids in the same area in a week from now, with my amazing Syrian uh, partners. These are the steps that change history. This is based on science. This is based on experience. Teach and model empathy. Teach and model shared reason, rational compromise, and shared values a la the Kantian model. Emphasize the positive in all things. Face problems, but don't let your brain get fixated only on problems. Have vision. Use your neocortex, not just with the news and plants in you and your amygdala. Go to the neocortex. Don't let the news keep you in a place of Neanderthal fear. Empower women everywhere. Embrace gentle commerce that is equal and that has purpose and that has care and love and honor and respect. And above all, love a stranger wherever you go, across the street, across the world. Find your strangers and love them, and you will change history. You will change the world. Indeed, we all are right now. No one, no dictator, no gang, no state, no war can steal the seed you plant in the heart of a stranger. The heart of the stranger is the heart of this world, and it is the path to its salvation. And so I ask you, there are a few paths to the stranger. I ask you to join it all. I'd love you all as Facebook friends, because network is everything. And at the same time, when you leave this hall today, look for somebody who you would never talk to and talk to them and say, my name is this. Who are you? Where do you come from? And you will change the world with them. Thank you very much. Blessings. <laughs>